Anyone who has a following in any field of entertainment knows that while your fans are your biggest supporters, in many ways they can also be your worst critics. And over the years there have been numerous cases of fans stalking and harassing public figures as their obsessions became overzealous. And should a celebrity deviate from the character that these particular fans created in their minds, things can quickly turn dangerous, and in some cases, deadly. Such would be the case for Selena, Christina Grimmie, Rebecca Schaefer, and even Versace himself, though his fans' motive remains unclear. But perhaps two of the most prolific examples would be the planned slayings of one half of the English rock band, The Beatles who every major publication has listed as the biggest selling musical act of all time. Yet and still, two of their members would see an early grave. You're watching Justified by Jury, and in the 10th chapter of the Unfortunate Demise series, we will briefly touch on their rise to fame, the many deaths of those close to them, their solo endeavors, and diving deep into the premonitions and prophecies spoken onto the group. The brutal murder of one member that left the world in shock and the horrific attempted murder on another, which ultimately expedited his demise. If there are any other artists you'd like to see covered in the Unfortunate Demise series, please leave your suggestions in the comments below. Let's get started. Growing up in Liverpool, England in the 1940s and 50s, John Lennon had developed a passion for music, and throughout World War II and dealing with much of the aftermath, music became a sweet escape from the harsh realities around him. As he entered his teens, he became involved with the skiffle craze at that time. Skiffle was a genre that had jazz, blues, and folk influence, very popular in African American musical culture in the 1920s, and it was making a resurgence in Great Britain by the 1950s. Merging the sound with rock and roll influences, John founded a band called the Blackjacks with some of his school friends, and they played at parties, school dances, cinemas, and amateur skiffle contests. The group would have several name and lineup changes, and by 1957, Paul McCartney, whom the band met at church, was invited to join as a rhythm guitarist, and he formed a close working relationship with John. George Harrison would join in 1958 as the lead guitarist, followed by John's art school friend Stuart Sutcliffe on bass, and Pete Best on drums in 1960. And by August of that year, the group, now known as the Silver Beatles, had become popular enough that they would leave Liverpool and head to Hamburg, Germany, where the music scene was taking off. Though the big move was a huge risk, as Hamburg had once been the fourth largest seaport in the world, but during World War II, half of the city was reduced to rubble by American and British bombing raids. So by 1960, only 15 years had passed when this first wave of British musicians started to wash the shores of the Hamburg Harbor. By now, the city had grown into far more wealth and opportunity than the boys' hometown of Liverpool. But it was also a very dangerous city, with crime everywhere you look, so the boys' families were not thrilled to see them go to the enemy's land to play rock and roll music. But still, they embarked on the journey, and once there, they started getting gigs, performing their own renditions of popular songs. The group honed their performance skills and widened their reputation, as they would win whole crowds over with their amazing talents. And these crowds weren't the friendliest of people. The group's longtime collaborator, Tony Sheridan, spoke of how the teens and young adults in the Hamburg nightclub were wartime kids with psychological problems and that fights often broke out. Sometimes beer bottles were thrown on stage and at one point while he was playing with the boys on stage he looked out into the crowd and someone was being murdered. But he knew to just keep on playing as if he didn't see anything. As with them being musicians it was easier to stay alive because if you played everybody liked you. Even the bad people and the gangsters like music so for the most part, they had everyone on their side. Their talents would also catch the eye of Brian Epstein, and after hearing some of the demo recordings, he decided to offer the boys a fixed management deal making £50 per week for life, which today would be equivalent to about $1,400 a week for life. And they told him he better come with something better than that. So after doing better negotiating, they agreed to bring him on as their manager. The group now known as the Beatles were in high demand by concert promoters, and they were fastly becoming a big hit in Hamburg. But like with any group, there was infighting going on, as Stewart was small in size and was often picked on by the other members. He was described in most Beatles biographies as appearing very uncomfortable on stage and often playing with his back to the audience, yet he was still a fan favorite. The group always gave him a hard time, especially Paul, but in a big brother, little brother kind of way. And one night, after Paul had dissed Stewart's girlfriend, Stu had about enough of it 
and fought Paul on stage, which caught everyone off guard because he wasn't the fighting type. But he gave Paul something to think about that night. Not long after this, Stewart's girlfriend convinced him to leave the band and return to his true passion, which was art. And in the summer of 1961, he left to attend the Hamburg College of Art. But just six months later, he had collapsed during an art class after weeks of intense headaches and light sensitivity. He would be examined by German doctors and sent back to the UK, where he was told nothing was wrong. But on April 10th, 1962, he had collapsed again, and his girlfriend rode with him in the ambulance to the hospital, but he died before they arrived. The cause of death was later determined as cerebral hemorrhage, specifically a ruptured aneurysm resulting in cerebral paralysis due to severe bleeding on the right side of the brain. He was 21 years old. Now after Stewart's autopsy revealed a dent in his skull, many books written on the Beatles speculated that his condition was caused by an earlier head injury, stating that he may have been either kicked in the head or thrown head first into a brick wall during an argument after a performance in January of 61, and his group members fought off his attackers before dragging him to safety. But Stewart's own sister would later claim that the fracture in his skull came from an unprovoked attack by John Lennon himself, months before Stewart's death. She would go on to insinuate many other things about Stewart's relationship to different members in the group, but none of her claims could ever be proven, and she was dismissed as being an attention seeker. But the group was shaken up big time by his death especially John, and although he did not attend nor send flowers to the funeral, his second wife Yoko Ono later recalled that Lennon mentioned Stu's name very often, saying that he was my alter ego, a spirit in my world, a guiding force. Now following this, the group would soon soar to global superstardom, but not before another change would take place, as the group wasn't particularly fond of Pete's drumming and felt he had little improvement over his time in the group. They had played several gigs with drummer Ringo Starr on occasions whenever Pete was sick. The Beatles enjoyed Ringo's drumming style and social demeanor with the band, whereas Pete rarely socialized with the other band members after shows. Paul McCartney later said it had got to the point that Pete was holding us back. What are we going to do, pretend that he was a wonderful drummer? So they would have their manager remove Pete and replace him with Ringo as the fourth and final member to the lineup, and together they would release their first hit, Love Me Do in late 1962, and immediately they blew up in the UK. Their enormous popularity garnered them the term Beatlemania, which describes intense fan frenzy directed toward the British band. They acquired the nickname The Fab Four as Beatlemania grew in Britain over the following year, and by 1964 they had become international stars, leading the British invasion of the US pop market throughout the 60s and up until 1970. The group would release 12 studio albums, and each one topped the charts in one or more countries. The group had endless awards and accolades and set records, broke records, and to this day have record sales in excess of 600 million worldwide. That includes single sales, and not to mention several live studio albums and endless compilation albums. What about the reports that you guys are nothing but a bunch of British Elvis oh, It's fine. not true, it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> but throughout their success, death still plagued the group. In 1964, a popular psychic named Gene Dixon, who had predicted the assassination of John F. Kennedy, had also predicted that the Beatles would be killed in an airplane crash while on their 1964 tour. In the following year, when John was asked what his demise would be, he said, in dark humor, we'll either go in a plane crash or we'll be popped off by some loony. Now, it's unclear if any of the members understood that life and death is in the power of the tongue, or maybe they fully understood and that's why he said it. But either way, during a flight to Portland that year, one of the engines on their aircraft would catch fire and smoke began to fill the cabin. This, of course, frightened everyone on board, most notably John, who tried several times to get the emergency exit open and had to be subdued. Thankfully, the pilots were able to land the aircraft safely, and though the group vowed never to fly again, just two days later, they would take another plane to LA. And this time, as they boarded, Ringo shouted, let's stay alive in 65. But it wouldn't be the Beatles themselves who would die in a plane crash. Instead, their former pilot, Reed Pigman, would use the same exact airplane that the boys used throughout their 1964 tour to fly some new army recruits from California to Georgia. 
and when their plane tried to land in Oklahoma for refueling, Reed would suffer a heart attack, and the plane would miss the runway, crashing into a hill and killing 83 out of the 98 people on board. This happened in early 1966, and around this time the Beatles were catching heat for John Lennon's infamous words regarding Christianity, saying that it will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue about that. I'm right, and I'll be proved right. We're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. Jesus was all right, but his disciples were thick and ordinary. It's them twisting it that ruins it for me. And while many in the UK where he made these statements had shrugged it off, fans in the US were in an uproar over his remarks and would hold bonfires where they burned any Beatles memorabilia that they owned. Several radio stations also refused to play the Beatles music and the group were blacklisted from certain events. Still, the group's popularity only continued to soar with their 1967 album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and it propelled the group from international stardom to legendary stardom, exceeding that of all previous Beatles albums, and it sustained its immense popularity well into the 21st century. As a matter of fact, in 2003, Rolling Stone had ranked this album at number one on its list of the greatest albums of all time. The Beatles appeared to double down on John's statement about Christianity when pressed in interviews, and their album cover, which contained faces of public figures who've inspired the Beatles, also infamously included Aliester Crowley, one of the most influential occult leaders of the 20th century. Again, not sitting well with most conservative listeners at that time. But in the heat of this success, their longtime manager, Brian Epstein, would pass away in August of that year at 32 years old from an overdose, which left the group in shambles both emotionally and business-wise, as there were already many business conflicts brewing behind the scenes. But ultimately, the group's creative differences in music and other passions led to the group's split less than three years later. John was the first to walk out on the group just months before their last album, Let It Be, would be released. But not before he and his newlywed wife, Yoko, would receive fan mail warning that someone was going to attempt to assassinate him. In the letter, the fan wrote that they were using a Ouija board and that the spirit of the group's manager, Brian, had came through to warn the fan of what was to transpire. Dear Mr. Lemon, from information I received while using a Ouija board, I believe that there will be an attempt to assassinate you. The spirit that gave me this information was Brian Epstein. <laughs> they were filming a documentary while he opened the mail, so I'm sure that he was trying to keep his cool for the cameras. But John would often say that everything will be okay in the end. And if it's not okay, it's not the end. Now a solo artist, John's accomplishments are far too numerous to name in one video. But in his lifetime, he had released five solo studio albums and five studio albums with his wife Yoko. He had appeared in several TV shows and movies as himself, and wrote three books, the last being released after his death. He and Yoko were also political activists who organized a series of peace protests and events in an effort to end the Vietnam War. The couple also supported other social and political causes, including civil rights and environmentalism. Also, many of the songs that they put out together addressed issues such as women's rights, peace, social justice, and a few anti-war anthems. They had even donated 75000 to the Black Panther Party. These things were, of course, not without criticism, though. And in 1973, John was facing deportation from the states, as former President Nixon believed that Lenin's anti-war activities could cost him his re-election. It was crazy. But by 1975, John had decided to shift his focus from music towards raising his family. He hadn't been around much for his first son, Julian, from his first marriage but he and his wife Yoko had welcomed his son Sean and had purchased an apartment in the acclaimed Dakota building located right across from Central Park in the Upper West Side area of Manhattan and would take a five-year hiatus from the entertainment industry altogether while still maintaining political activism. And by mid-1980, on a sailing trip from Rhode Island to Bermuda, their vessel encountered a severe storm. One by one, the crew of five that were with him were overcome with fatigue and seasickness leaving to John to take the wheel alone for six hours. It had the effect of both renewing his confidence and making him contemplate how fragile life is. As a result, he began to write new songs and reworked earlier demos. He said later that I was so centered after the experience at sea that I was tuned into the cosmos and all these songs came to me. 
The finishing product would be titled Double Fantasy, a love-filled joint album with his wife Yoko, which would be released three weeks before his demise. However, during this time, the prophecies of the fan with the Ouija board and John Lennon himself were starting to manifest, as a troubled man by the name of Mark Chapman, who was once a huge fan of John, had made it his mission to murder him in October of 1980. According to Mark's wife Gloria Hiroko, he had traveled to New York that month and came home scared, saying that in order to make a name for himself that he had planned to kill John Lennon. But he said that her love had saved him from doing so and that he threw his gun into the ocean and she believed him. But according to Mark, he had become obsessed with the novel Catcher in the Rye and saw himself as the living embodiment of Holden Caulfield, the book's angry protagonist who rages against adult hypocrisy and phonies. Mark claimed to have a hit list of celebrities that he felt were phonies, including Paul McCartney, Marlon Brando, Elizabeth Taylor, John F. Kennedy's wife Jacqueline, Ronald Reagan, among others, but stated that he chose Lennon because he was the most famous and that the killing was motivated by John's infamous remark that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus, and by the lyrics of John's songs like God in which he states that he does not believe in God, Jesus, or the Beatles for that matter, and his other song Imagine where he says, imagine no possessions. Yet John and Yoko had a lavish lifestyle as they had rented out several apartment units in the Dakotas, which gave them a total of nine bedrooms. And additionally, they bought units to turn one into a studio, one into storage, one was used as a guest house, etc. Which in Mark's mind made Lennon a phony. So in early December, he would leave his wife Gloria once again, this time telling her that he needed time to grow up as an adult and husband, and needed time to think about his life. So they made a pact to sacrifice being alone for a short time so that they could have a long, happy marriage together. But instead, he spent days scoping out the linens and their routines. And on the morning of December 8, 1980, Mark waited for Lennon outside the Dakota apartments and spent most of the day near the entrance talking to other fans and the doorman. Mark initially was distracted and missed seeing Lennon step out of the cab to enter his apartment. Meanwhile, the family nanny, Helen, was returning from a walk with Lennon's five-year-old son, Sean. Mark had reached out in front of the housekeeper to shake Sean's hand and said that he was a beautiful boy, quoting one of Lennon's songs off the new album called Beautiful Boy. Just sickening, man. But anyways, renowned photographer Annie Leibovitz went to the Lennon's apartment to do what would be Lennon's last photo shoot for Rolling Stone magazine, but he insisted that Yoko be on the cover with him. And as promised, the shot would go down as one of the most famous pieces of art in history. Things would wrap up in the afternoon, and John would go downstairs to Yoko's home studio office to give his last interview with RKO Network, in which he reflected on his recent 40th birthday celebration and on what middle age had in store for him, saying, I hope I die before Yoko, because if Yoko died, I don't know how to survive. I couldn't carry on. Yet he kept it optimistic, also saying, I always consider my work one piece, whether it be with the Beatles, David Bowie, Elton John, or Yoko, and I consider that my work won't be finished until I'm dead and buried, and I hope that's a long, long time. After this, he and his wife would leave around 5 p.m. to head to a recording studio to mix a song off of Yoko's new album. As they left the building, they were approached by Mark, who had asked Lennon to sign a copy of his album, Double Fantasy. He knew that Lennon liked to give autographs or pictures, especially to those who had been waiting for long periods of time to meet him. RKO radio special. And he came out of the building, and the photographer that I mentioned earlier, Paul Gorish, he kind of pushed me forward and said, here's your chance. You know, you've been waiting all day. You've come from Hawaii to have him sign your album. Go, go. And I was very nervous. And I, I was right in front of John Lennon there instantly. And... I had a black Bic pen, and I said, John, would you sign my album? And he said, sure. Yoko went and got into the car, and he pushed the button on the pen and started to get it to write. It was a little uh, hard to get to write at first. And then he wrote his name, John Lennon, and then underneath that, 1980. And he looked at me, as I mentioned earlier, he said, is that all? Do you want anything else? And I felt uh, then and now that he knew something subconsciously that 
he was looking into the eyes of the person that was going to kill him. After this, they would go, record the song, and after the recording process wrapped up, Yoko suggested that they go to a late night deli, but John wanted to stop back by the apartments to say goodnight to his son. They arrived at around 10.45 p.m., and instead of their limousine driving into the more secure courtyard, they parked on the curb since all they were doing was running inside real quick. But Mark had been lying in wait for their return, and he had his book with him in which he wrote inside, to Holden Caulfield, from Holden Caulfield. This is my statement. And as the Lennons walked past him and toward the archway entrance, Yoko would pass by first, and he nodded at her. But as John passed by, he glanced briefly at Mark, appearing to recognize him from earlier, and seconds later, Mark drew his 38 Special Revolver and fired five rounds at John. One bullet missed and hit a window, but two bullets entered in the left side of John's back, traveling through the left side of his chest and his left lung, with one exiting from the body and one lodged in his neck. Two more bullets hit him in his left shoulder. Bleeding profusely from his external wounds and from his mouth, he staggered up the steps to the security reception area where he said, I'm shot, I'm shot. He then fell to the floor, scattering cassette tapes that he was carrying. Mark, however, made no attempt to flee. He just stood there. Jose, the doorman, managed to shake the gun out of Mark's hand and kicked it across the pavement. Responding officers were immediately called to the scene. But after seeing the extent of John's wounds, they had no time to wait for an ambulance, and they put him in the back of the cop car and rushed him to the hospital. They tried to get him to form words, but all he could do was gurgle before he passed out. Once there, he was not breathing and had no pulse. The doctors rushed in but were unable to save him, and he would be pronounced dead sometime within 20 minutes of the 11 o'clock hour. Though the reports from the hospital staff have been inconsistent over the years with different time of death reporting as well as how much time they spent trying to resuscitate him. One doctor claimed that the two main doctors did very little at all and only acted concerned when they realized who it was. Witnesses at the hospital noted that the Beatles song All My Loving" came over the hospital sound system at the moment that Lennon was pronounced dead, which if true is a very odd coincidence, as again he had only been there for 20 minutes at most. Meanwhile, back at the scene, one cop had placed Mark under arrest without incident. Better cuff that guy. He actually uh, was fairly polite. I turned to him and I said, you know, you just threw your whole damn life away. Chapman started talking about a little person inside of him and a big person inside of him. Uh, the big person has been winning the battle up to now, but tonight the little person won the battle. He was taken to the 20th precinct where he was questioned for eight hours before being brought back to New York County Criminal Court. A judge remanded him to Bellevue Hospital for a psychiatric evaluation. Overnight, the world stopped in its tracks over the death of John Lennon, as the brutal death of someone who advocated for such peace had affected everyone. Many couldn't take it, and at least three of his fans would take their own lives in the wake of his death. His bandmates weren't on the best of terms with him when he died, but would issue statements to the press. But when asked directly, George Harrison would say, I just wanted to be in a band. Here we are 20 years later and some whack job has shot my mate. I just wanted to play guitar in a band. And Paul would tell reporters who hounded him the day after, drag in it. Okay, cheers, bye bye. A response that was widely criticized, but he was dealing with it in his own way. Ringo would fly to New York to be with Yoko and Sean. But what was more puzzling to the fans was Yoko's actions following John's death. Many fans of his already didn't care for Yoko as they felt that his marriage and loyalty to her is what drew him away from the Beatles in the first place. But the morning after the shooting, she issued a statement saying, there is no funeral for John. Later in the week we will set a time for a silent vigil to pray for his soul and we invite you to participate from wherever you are at the time. John loved and prayed for the human race, please pray the same for him. Love, Yoko, and Sean. That same day, his remains were cremated at Ferncliff Cemetery in Hartsdale, New York, and his ashes were later scattered in Central Park, in sight of their apartment. Many fans felt robbed by not having a traditional memorial service where they could come and say their final goodbyes to the legend. Yoko also requested that the official autopsy results not be released to the public, out of respect for the family's privacy. Moreover, their joint album, Double Fantasy, which had previously gotten terrible reviews and low sales when it was released three weeks earlier, was all of a sudden the rave and became a worldwide success winning the Grammy Award for Album of the Year 
as everyone wanted a piece of Lennon's works. Yoko would release her next album, Season of Glass, six months after his death. The cover of the album is a photograph of Lennon's blood spattered glasses that he was wearing when he was shot. She would also release Walking on Thin Ice, the last song they had mixed at the studio, as a single. Another song called I Don't Know Why was a somber tune recorded the day after John died. And while this was wholesome and tear-jerking to many, this only further propelled suspicion from others. But this was Yoko's way of mourning and paying tribute to her husband. And she would do so like how they did everything else, in song. Now John's killer was later charged with secondary murder because apparently premeditation in the state of New York was not sufficient enough to warrant the charge of first degree murder at the time. Why? Only God knows. But despite advice by his lawyers to plead insanity, Mark stood ten toes down and pleaded guilty to murdering Lennon, saying that his guilty plea was the will of God. He was sentenced to 20 years to life with eligibility for parole in 2000. Before his sentencing, he was given the opportunity to address the court, at which point he read a passage from that damn book, The Catcher in the Rye. But in recent years, his stance has changed, saying his reasons for doing it was for notoriety. But that's all behind him, as he's found Jesus now. And as of September 2022, he has been denied parole 12 times and remains incarcerated at Green Haven Correctional Facility. Yet his wife, Gloria Hiroko, who felt betrayed by him, stayed by him, and the married couple is allowed 44 conjugal visits per year. But many folks over the past 42 years haven't bought the story, and one author, David Wellen, was determined to get down to the bottom of it, focusing mainly on the bullets recovered from the scene. Now, back in school, we learned that the bullets that struck Lennon were hollow point bullets designed to expand upon impact with any target. I vividly remember that, and being shaken up by it. But from David's research, only two of the slugs were ever entered into evidence, according to the documents. But the whereabouts of the missing three bullets is unknown. But the two bullets which were removed from Lennon's body were marked as being of different types. This coupled with mixed reports saying that Lennon was shot in the chest. According to doctors, John Lennon was shot four times in the chest, with three of the bullets exiting his back. While Mark clearly says that he shot Lennon in the back. I pulled the 38 revolver out of my pocket. I went into what's called a combat stance and I fired at his back five steady shots. This led David to conclude that there was more than one shooter. But other spectators have theorized that this was a hit by the CIA and that Mark was simply a fall guy. Though many would cast doubt on this hypothesis for the simple fact that you can have different types of ammunition in a single revolver. But David maintains that he's spoken with the surgeon who treated Lennon and the two nurses who assisted, as well as uncovering other witness testimonies which don't appear to correspond with the official narrative and is wanting a full investigation reopened into the murder. We shall see if his request will be granted. I don't know though. But John Lennon and Paul McCartney weren't the only ones with successful solo careers after the Beatles. Though he was known as the Quiet Beatle, George Harrison would release My Sweet Lord as his official debut single following the group's disbandment, which has gone down as a classic hymn, sang by those in worship of the God they serve. Over the past decades, many artists have covered this song, like Edwin Starr, Johnny Mathis, and Nina Simone. George himself praised the Hindu God, Krishna, who is the God of protection, compassion, tenderness, and love. So while the word hallelujah is being chanted throughout the song, he would also incorporate the chants of Hare Krishna, in which one becomes purified of material conditioning. The single would go on to become the biggest selling single of 1971 in the UK, and in the Americas, the song would be the first number one solo single by any Beatles member. Now from the 1970s and well into the 90s, George founded his own record label, Dark Horse Records, and released 11 studio albums and a host of successful singles before forming a supergroup called the Traveling Wilburys with a lineup that represented four eras of rock music history. Their members included legends like Bob Dylan, Tom Petty, and Roy Orbison. But right as the quintet was getting off the ground, Roy would die of a heart attack at his mother's house. And the group, now a quartet, would go on to release two studio albums, Volume 1 and Volume 3. Ain't no Volume 2. And both albums would go platinum, selling over 6 million records total. 
But beyond the music, George was equally passionate about charity work, particularly in the Middle East, as he had a passion for Indian music and Eastern culture in general. Many of his Indian gurus were featured on the cover of the group's Sgt. Pepper album, and George was responsible for incorporating Eastern instruments into many of the Beatles songs. He later put together a series of groundbreaking benefit concerts at Madison Square Garden to raise money for refugees of the Bangladesh Liberation War. The concert for Bangladesh featured many celebrities and would go on to raise some $15 million for UNICEF. There would also be a Grammy-winning album of the same name and successful documentary of the same name. This laid the groundwork for future benefit shows like Live Aid and Farm Aid. George also started his own film production company, Handmade Films, and produced 27 movies, including Life of Brian, before eventually selling his interest in the company in 1994. That same year, the remaining three Beatles would reunite to record new songs for their anthology project. Up to this point, George had built a legacy and a family with his wife Olivia and his twin son, Donnie, who would help produce his last album. But not before George, who was once a heavy smoker, would develop throat cancer in 1997. He said, I got it purely from smoking. I gave up cigarettes many years ago, but had started again for a while and then stopped shortly before the doctors found a lump. His cancer was treated with surgery and radiation, and things appeared to be on the up and up. But little did he know, a 34-year-old schizophrenic man named Michael Abram was plotting his demise. Michael had been dealing with paranoid schizophrenia for close to a decade and believed that all four members of the Beatles were witches and practitioners of black magic. And while he himself did not want to kill anyone, he believed that he was the Archangel Michael and had been sent by God on a mission to kill George, who he described as the Phantom Menace. And in typical fashion, he would reference the Beatles saying they were more popular than Jesus, as it really upset him. Now, following the brutal murder of John Lennon, all the other members of the Beatles had taken security measures at their homes in the years that followed. George and his family had lived in a heavily fortified mansion in Oxfordshire, England, which had security cameras at nearly every angle. But by late 1999, George's mother-in-law was also living there. And on the early morning hours of December 30th, 1999, Mike had somehow gotten past the security and into the garden where he broke the wing off of the family statue of St. Michael and threw it into a window entering their home. George's wife Olivia said that she awoke to the sounds of glass shattering and woke up her husband and said, hey, someone's broken in. She went to go lock her room door, but with her mother being right down the hall, George didn't want either woman to be harmed, so he would man up and would run out of the room in the pitch black to an area overlooking the ground level. Immediately, he smelled cigarette smoke, so he knew a home invasion was likely taking place. At this point, he could spot Mike, who had just ran out from the kitchen, holding a spear from the statue in one hand and a knife in the other. Immediately, he began shouting at George to come downstairs, but in an attempt to disorient Mike, George started chanting, Hare Krishna, repeatedly, which was probably the worst thing he could have said in that moment, as Michael believed that George was cursing at him in the devil's tongue, and that this only further justified God's will for him to execute the man. This guy was, was saying, you know, get down here, get down here, you know, what do you want? He said, you know what I want. It was just horrible. It was just like this voice from the bowels of hell, and, uh, and then he just ran up the store up the stairs he was in a florid psychotic state and he was tall and young george tried to run into one of the bedrooms but it was locked so with nowhere else to turn he decided to fight back but mike would tackle george and while on top of him he began stabbing him repeatedly with the knife one of the stab wounds punctured his lung at that point george said i could feel the strength drain from me I vividly remember a deliberate thrust of the knife and felt my chest deflate and the flow of blood toward my mouth. I believed I had been fatally stabbed, but Olivia was determined to get one up on the attacker. I don't know, something just took over and I grabbed a um, poker. My dad was a big baseball fan and he used to always say, follow through. That's all I could think of was you're not, don't throw like a girl, follow through. I mean, it got worse, it just got worse, because I hit the guy several times, you know, I could see the blood spreading down his blonde hair, and then he got up, you know, he got up and he chased me and had me around the neck, and then George got up and jumped on his back, 
And poor Georgie said, you know, God, just when he got off of me, I was thinking, oh, good. Then I had to get up and fight him again. And he'd already been stabbed. Uh, but we all fell into a big pile, and I managed to get out from underneath, and George pinned him down, and George said to me, I've got the knife. And I thought, what knife? George said, you know, I was lying there, and I was thinking, I can't believe it. After everything that's happened to me, I'm going to be murdered. I'm being murdered in my own home. And since I'm being murdered and I'm going to die, I better start uh, letting go of this life. Too exhausted to fight further, Olivia fled downstairs, convinced that they were about to be killed. At that point, two police officers arrived, saving them from further attack. Mike would surrender to police, and as he was led off to the hospital, it's alleged that he mumbled to the officers, I did it, I did it. Now, different publications like Daily Mail, Liverpool Echo, along with several fan sites, claim that in addition to a punctured lung, that George had also suffered over 40 stab wounds. But Wikipedia said it was more like five. Several publications and British documentaries on the singer also claim that their mansion had over 100 rooms, yet Olivia claimed in a 2004 interview that it was more around 30 rooms. Now why this big a gap in inconsistencies, I'm not entirely sure. But in any case, George and Olivia would eventually make a full recovery. But with all of the Y2K fanfare happening, as this was the turn of the new millennium, the story wouldn't receive a whole lot of coverage in the states, mostly because he didn't die either. Now Mike would be found innocent by reason of insanity, and was confined to a mental hospital for two years before being let back out on the street. And at that time, he expressed being deeply embarrassed and ashamed about the terrible thing he did and vowed to be a good boy from here on out. Now, this attack understandably changed George's entire outlook on life. And while many close to him said he moved on from the incident, it affected his will to fight once his health started to deteriorate again. If I was dying now, what would I think? What would I miss? Would I, if I had to leave my body you know, in an hour's time, what is it that I would miss? And I think, well, I've got a son who needs a father, so I have to stick around for him as long as I can. But um, other than that, I can't think of much reason to be here. <laughs> and just a little over a year later, in early 2001, it was revealed that cancer had returned this time as a growth on one of his lungs, and he had surgery to remove it. But by July, the cancer had spread to his brain, and while being treated in Switzerland, Ringo would visit him and spend time with him, but had to leave early to travel back to Boston where his daughter was undergoing her own emergency brain surgery. Now George, who was very weak at this point, asked Ringo, you want me to come with you? Which was a testament to his service for others, even in his weakest moments. And on November 29th, 2001, George died peacefully at a property belonging to his bandmate, Paul, with his wife, his son, a few friends, and Hare Krishna devotees who chanted verses from the Bhagavad Gita, which was an ancient Hindu scripture, as George transitioned. His final message to the world was, everything else can wait, but the search for God cannot wait and to love one another. He would be cremated at Hollywood Forever Cemetery and his ashes were scattered in the rivers in India in a Hindu tradition. His final studio album, Brainwashed, was released in 2002 after being completed by his son Donnie and longtime collaborator Jeff Lynn. A quote from the Bhagavad Gita is included in the album's liner notes saying, There never was a time when you or I did not exist, nor will there be any future when we shall cease to be. Two of the singles from the album would each win a Grammy Award at the 2004 Grammys. And since George's death in 2001, the two remaining members have not reunited as the Beatles. However, in 2023, it was announced that the pair were finishing an unfinished project from the anthology era in which George was a part of. Now, the other two members, Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr, still carry on the legacy through their music and many endeavors to this day. Even though the ever so popular theory of Paul dying in a car crash in 1966 and being replaced with a clone by Britain's top security is still widely believed to this day. I might address this theory in a later video, but I want to thank everyone who made it this far for watching, as this is Justified by Jury. 
y'all know how to hit that like and y'all know how to hit that subscribe if you want to do so and i'll catch y'all on the next one